1658 lecture 40 um the last class we were discussing the stability of uh, delta sigma modulators uh, the basic idea is the following so the biggest difficulty with this uh, with a uh, delta sigma modulator is the fact that it is a nonlinear feedback system uh, and you have a pretty strong nonlinearity in the uh, inside the loop in there are step changes in the output for a given change uh, for a infinitesimal change in the input right uh, so it is surprising that uh, one can use any linear analysis tools at all and come to any reasonable conclusion uh, fortunately or strangely it happens that uh, you can get away with a lot by, by assuming that the quantizer is linear and uh, by so to illustrate the concept of uh, you know what we mean by linearizing a quantizer or any nonlinear block for that matter let us say the input to the nonlinear element was comprised of two waveforms uh, one which is shown here as x1 which in this case happens to be a sine wave and another waveform which is n1 which in this case happens to be some random noise okay this is now processed through a quantizer with this kind of characteristic right so the steps basically straddle a straight line and uh, the output is uh, uh, you know as we would all expect is a nonlinear function of both x1 and n1 since since we are interested in a linear approximation to the uh, to this nonlinear element what we do is the following we assume that the output is coming from a linear system in other, in other words the output is a linear combination of x1 and n1 okay. and uh, if it if that assumption was indeed true then when you fit the output uh, as a linear combination of x1 and n1 that is you express the output as g1 x1 plus g2 x2 or g2 n n1 and go and find what g1 and g2 are given that you know x1 n1 and v1 the error which is the norm of g1 x1 plus g2 n1 minus the output must be 0 correct in practice I mean clearly uh, the block is not linear so when you do the math you will find that the the, uh, the error that is v1 minus g1 x1 plus g2 n1 the uh, the mean square value i mean the square value in this case uh, is not zero but there is a small difference and uh, the difference is visually you know kind of visible here you can see that the magenta one is the is the actual quantized waveform in this particular example the output is, qua is the quantizer has got steps of 0 0.1 and uh, the blue curve is the is the linear combination g1 x1 plus g2 n1 and g1 and g2 you know numerically have been found to be almost close to 1 this kind of makes sense because you can see the average slope of the staircase is 1 does that make sense so this whole uh, you know method of analyzing nonlinear systems you know trying to fit them as linear systems is uh, is a classical area in nonlinear control and has been around for yeah, you know 70 years okay this uh, uh, this type of analysis is called describing function analysis and clearly one uh, you know one sees that the gain of uh, one input to the output is dependent on the other input also correct so uh, <coughs> and uh, you know not uh, surprisingly it also depends on the specific wave shape and so on so a lot of people have gone and sat and computed uh, you know given the shape of a nonlinearity and the kind of input you have you can go and compute the so called describing function which will be a function of amplitude and so on for example if uh, let us say you had a nonlinearity like this and the input was a sine wave the output will be a clipped sine wave okay all right so uh, I mean so the so called linear approximation to this is simply a constant gain correct which is the fundamental of 
you expand the output of the Fourier series, you remove all the other harmonics other than the fundamental, right? The ratio of the fundamental amplitude to the input amplitude is the is the gain. I mean that is exactly the same thing. I mean if you if you if the input was a pure tone, then doing the minimum I mean minimum mean square fit between the output and the input is equivalent to taking the Fourier series and knocking off all the harmonics. Do you know that? Right? So uh, so the, I mean so this is an example of linearizing a nonlinear element with uh, uh, you know with a single input. The same thing can be done to multiple inputs and one example is here and as you can see the the approximation error is actually quite small okay uh, just because the approximation error is small it does not lend credence to uh, the method of analysis it just so happens that people found that this kind of analysis would make would work in a lot of circumstances right and uh, uh, and there were other, of course there were a lot of other circumstances where it would not work and you know, give you wrong results but uh, it worked a lot of the times and 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 people did use it as a tool for designing nonlinear systems okay in the specific context of delta sigma modulators we, uh, the only reason i'm going into this detail is simply to give you an intuitive feel for why delta sigma modulators become unstable once the input amplitude becomes large okay so we're not going to get into the the details of you know how you use uh, describing functions to go and calculate anything uh, all that is best done uh, you know given that computers are so fast today all that is simply done numerically right but you must know intuitively why these things happen and the trend that you would expect when one of these things change for example uh, if the input amplitude becomes smaller you would think that the approximation would become better uh, and you know that kind of intuition is all that i am interested in uh, you understand okay so uh, the second example we took yesterday was to take the the same input and the same noise okay and pass it through a quantizer which is now overloaded in other words if the output of the quantizer is greater than 0 0.5 the i'm sorry if the input of the quantizer is greater than 0 0.5 the output level is just clipped to 0 0.5 okay similarly if the input is less than minus 0 0.5 the the level is still clipped all right and within the uh, within that range of plus 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5 you have you have a step like waveform menu all right and clearly we see that uh, the gain for the signal which is the uh, the blue sine wave has understandably dropped to dropped to 0 0.6 it's no longer close to 1 and that makes sense because during these parts of the sine wave right the the sine wave comes out as is all right however when the output is clipped the sine wave for example at its peak which is supposed to be 1 is only 0 0.5 so you can if you kind of uh, you know uh, think of this as some kind of variable gain you can see that the gain is dropping off from 1 the moment the the, the quantizer is clipped does it make sense so if you want to find the so called average gain the average gain is 1 for some part of the sine wave cycle and smaller than 1 but never going to 0 the minimum the smallest it goes to is half okay so it is 1 for some part of the cycle it is less than 1 for some part of the cycle okay so you can see that the the average gain is about 0 0.6 which uh, the g1 and g2 have got from simply number crunching hmm? but we see that the number makes sense now what uh, uh, we also see when we compute the gain as far as the noise is concerned or this n signal n1 is concerned is that it is it is definitely smaller than 1 but it is smaller than g1 and this also makes sense because when the sine wave is uh, you know when the input is within that staircase region the gain for the noise is uh, for n1 is approximately 1 the moment the output is clipped the gain is actually zero correct so clearly the uh, the average gain has to be smaller than the gain for the sine wave itself and that may so and that's confirmed by doing the math 
So you can see that the gain for the noise like signal is is now much smaller than the gain for the for the sine wave itself. Correct? And why are we so interested in sine wave plus a noise like signal? I mean, so the uh, the whole motivation for this discussion is the fact that in when you are running a sigma delta modulator, the input to the quantizer is basically the in, virtually the input signal itself plus the quantization noise going through a filter with an equivalent impulse response of NTF of Z minus 1. That is what we found yesterday, which is why it makes sense to see what happens to the uh, quantizer output when the input is a similar type of signal, which is sine wave plus some kind of noise. Does this make sense? All right. So, let us continue on. So, the bottom line behind the discussion is that the uh, signal and noise gains through the quantizer are approximately 1 when there is no overload. With overload, the signal gain is less than 1 and the noise gain is also less than 1 and definitely the noise gain is less than the signal gain. A further point which you also understand by now is that the noise gain depends on on the signal itself, correct. If the signal amplitude is, is very high, the noise gain will become smaller. So, we will get back to our basic diagram of uh, a sigma delta modulator again. So, I just replace the loop filter by this big, big black box. The uh, the signal is x, okay, with the uh, Z transform capital X. This is V, and this is Y of Z. The loop filter output Y of Z is nothing but L naught times x plus L1 times Okay, this is just a slight uh, difference from what we have I mean yesterday we have uh, I mean all along we had used uh, the loop filter to be working just I mean uh, uh, working on x minus v okay, which is equivalent to saying L naught and L 1 are the same. Okay, In general you can have you can have different L naught and, and L 1 and we have seen an example of this already in our second order modulator example the we had 1 by 1 minus z inverse one by one minus z inverse this is the quantizer this is the z inverse which is needed to avoid delay free loops in the modulator. Okay. So, this is the quantization error. This is x, all right, and this is the loop filter, correct. So, what is L1 or L0 in this? Uh, what is L0? Come on, quick people is 1 by 1 minus z inverse the whole square L 1 is what sorry not uh, you can you can push the z inverse also into the loop and yeah. So, what is L 1? It is okay z inverse upon 1 minus z inverse okay and how many parts are there from uh, 
the input to the output there are two paths ok the gain of the first path is uh, minus z inverse by 1 minus z inverse what is the first path like this ok and there is another path which is like this what is that what is the gain of that path minus z inverse by 1 minus z inverse minus z inverse by 1 minus z inverse the whole square. So, you can see that clearly L naught and L 1 you know even in the simple case that we saw are not the same. Now that we have this we if you are interested in only finding out I mean uh, let us take a simple example where to make matters extremely uh, simplified we will assume DC inputs ok and so if we put in a DC input what should be the volt uh, what, is, what should be the signal here should be DC plus shaped noise right. So, this is N T F of Z minus 1 times E of Z ok and the output here clearly is also will be DC plus N T F of Z times E of Z ok. Now, as I go on increasing the DC input amplitude, what do you think will happen as I keep hitting I mean so please note that this is a saturating quantizer correct. So, my input is first somewhere such that the signal is basically hovering around here ok and as I go on increasing my input what do you think will happen you will get to ok. So, initially the input is somewhere here the DC level is here and on top of it is riding some noise alright and you know as we saw in the very first example the output will be DC plus I mean and noise and the gain of the noise will always almost be equal to almost be equal to the input to the quantizer is DC plus some noise riding on it you are in that region where there is no overload. So, the output will virtually be will be same DC plus plus noise gain will be approximately 1 plus you will have some fitting error ok. Now, what do you think happens when you start to hit when the input reaches this level what I mean the signal gain will become also will small will remain smaller ok. The noise gain will also get smaller because what is happening when the now, when the input the when the signal goes up here it gets clipped off correct. So, equivalently the noise gain is is reducing or just like how we saw in the, the sine wave case ok. So, now if the noise gain is reducing I mean so let us try and figure out the the uh, I mean if the gain of the quantizer is is uh, is clearly as far as the noise is concerned the gain of the quantizer is dependent on the DC level correct and as the DC level goes up and up and up you can see that the you would expect that the moment you kind of get uh, start getting close to the to the saturation level the gain of the the gain for the noise quantization noise starts to decrease. So, you have a feedback loop and the gain decreases ok as far as the noise is concerned. So, what can you I mean so what can you say about the so called poles of the loop I mean do they remain at the same place or do they keep moving around they keep I mean what do you think the I mean if you replace the this by some gain g which is dependent on the DC input value and this I mean if, uh, if this was a constant then we know definitely that the poles of the system remain the same regardless of what the DC level is correct. Now, if the input level is rising the this this g happens to decrease with very very large dc inputs so in other words i mean sir do you think the g actually influences the poles of the closed loop system or they don't they definitely do right g definitely does because it's a part of the is a forward element in a feedback loop so as g as the input dc value keeps going up and up and up we find that the g actually decreases correct 
since the g decreases since the g decreases the poles start to start to move do you understand the closed loop poles will move is that clear to all of you okay now uh, what can you say about uh, so i mean so, uh, so how will you figure out so if the poles start to move it is very likely that the poles move i mean what do you want for the closed loop system to be stable the closed loop poles must be within the unit circle uh, but uh, you know because g is changing g was originally 1 correct because you are well within the you are not overloading the quantizer as you keep increasing the dc input the g starts to fall off okay and so how will you figure out at what value of g the the poles go out of the unit circle what kind of technique will you use in other words you are trying to figure out the position of the roots as g varies what is this technique is this is root locus you understand so by plotting the root locus of this system you will be able to figure out what the what the closed loop poles are for a given g or rather as g varies from 0 to 1 when g is 1 where are the poles let us assume that our ntf we were trying to realize the third order ntf and we said we are likely to have stability problems we said ntf of z is nothing but 1 minus z inverse the whole cube okay so where are the zeros this has got poles and zeros where are the poles and where are the zeros okay how many poles and how many zeros three poles and three zeros so where are the zeros how many zeros are there three zeros at z equal to 1 what about the poles the three poles and all of them are at z equal to 0 so if you draw the unit circle the for k equal to 1 for g equal to 1 there are three poles here and three zeros here all right and for k equal to 0 i mean for g equal to 0 where do you think the uh, the the poles are we don't really care about the zeros we are only interested in stability so we only care about the poles okay so uh, the three poles which were at the origin for g equal to 1 where will they move to if when g equal to 0 please note that this is the situation for g equal to 1 correct oh by the way why is that true so we have assumed that uh, the, I mean we have gone and done our uh, you know third order NTF assuming that the quantizer gain is 1 this, you are not overloaded right. So this is the situation for g equal to 1 okay. Now when g equal to 0 and we are trying to figure out what happens to these poles as the quantizer gain falls okay. In general you have to, uh, that can only be done once you know L0 and L1 correct but uh, definitely we know one thing that is what happens to the quantizer gain when uh, what happens to the uh, the po uh, the uh, the poles when g equal to 0 what are the poles of the system when g equal to 0 guys okay how will a third order modulator look like it will be 1 by 1 minus z inverse 1 by 1 minus z inverse 1 by 1 minus z inverse z inverse and this is some gain g okay when g is 1 we know where the poles and zeros are because we know the the ntf once you know the ntf we know that any transfer function within, within this system will have the same poles the poles of the ntf are at z equal to 0 the three poles when g is 0 what happens to the system yeah so where are the poles if z equal to infinity if the poles at z equal to infinity will become unstable open loop when does the output gain go to infinity guys when z equal to 1 okay so the poles which were here for g equal to 0 must move here for I'm sorry, the poles which are at zero for g equal to one must move to z equal to one 
then g equal to 0. Does it make sense? Correct? And depending on the order of the system, okay, you know you have all these funny looking contours, right? Actually, I do not now remember how the, the root locus will look like, but I know definitely that for some, we will probably do some something like this, okay. So, you can, I leave it to you as an exercise to go and calculate what the, the closed loop poles will be for, for a given uh, uh, gain g, okay. The key point to note is that as the quantizer gain starts to decrease, all right, there will be definitely a point at which the poles get out of the unit circle. So, all this funny stuff, this root locus will happen only with third order systems are higher, the second order system is very well behaved, okay. So, you can go and do the math yourselves and convince yourself that, okay. And the higher the order of the system, you know, the more the number of these branches which will, you know, uh, jump from 0 to uh, what do you call uh, the poles from z equal to 0 to something else. So, uh, you will find that that as the gain keeps falling even a linear analysis I mean please note that our system is horribly non-linear and we are trying to understand this by using some kind of linear model and the linear model itself predicts that the system will go unstable if the gain falls below a certain value, okay, all right. So, uh, not surprisingly, when you make these higher order modulators, you will find that exhibit signal dependent stability. Due to quantizer saturation, you must expect signal dependent stability, right. Why do we require, why do we need to expect signal dependent stability? We know that for a high order system, as you change the gain, definitely you will be able to find values of gain for which the poles move outside the, the, outside the unit circle and this is a fact of life, right? This comes from linear system theory. From our intuition based on, you know, linearizing the quantizer, we know that the gain falls off the moment the, the quantizer saturates, correct? So, putting that and this together means that when the input level starts to become larger and larger, DC level, you will definitely hit a, hit a situation where the, the system becomes unstable. Does it make sense? You understand? And uh, to get some more intuition, let us get back to this diagram. So, as I so, in other words, as the input DC level here keeps increasing, what is happening? The, the gain starts to drop the moment you start getting a little close to the threshold of the, I mean to the saturation level of the quantizer, correct? Now, as you get a little close, the gain falls. So, what do you think the poles are doing? They are moving towards the unit circle, correct? So, I mean, if the, if the poles start moving towards the unit circle, what can you, th what can you say about the quality factor of the poles? The quality factor of the poles increases, correct? Which means that what can you say about the, uh, the, uh, I mean, the noise amplification through the loop is, is proportional to the NTF, correct? So, for small signals, the NTF was like this. Now, the quality of the poles is, is increasing. So, you can think, I mean, you basically, once the quality factor of the pole starts to increase, you will start to see peaking. Once you start to see peaking, what happens to the variance of the noise here? The variance will increase, correct, okay. And the moment, the, I mean, the, the uh, that basically means that here, the distribution of noise was like this. Here, because the poles have a higher Q, what will happen is that this will do the variance of the noise increases, so its spread also increases. In other words, the quantizer will saturate more frequently now than if this noise was used. Does it make sense? Is that clear? So, I mean this whole thing is like, you know, it is feeding on itself, okay. 
So initially when you were in the no overload region, you had, I mean the, the gain is 1. So the noise transfer function does not really depend on what DC level you have. Okay. So there is some fixed variance to the, there is some fixed variance to the noise at the input of the quantizer. And the variance of that noise is simply given by the variance of the quantizer noise, uh, I mean the noise added by the quantizer which is delta square by 12 times. So the at the quantizer input, the noise part is NTF of Z minus 1 times E of Z which is, which means that the mean square value of uh, the quantization noise delta square by 12 times, please note that this inverse transforms to H of n which is the NTF impulse response minus delta of n. Okay. So, this is delta square by 12 times sigma H of n square minus 1. Okay. So, where does the minus 1 come? Okay. So, uh, this, this is simply a consequence of of Parseval, right. The mean square value in the time domain and the, the integrated mean square value in the uh, in the frequency domain are the same, correct. So, this is the mean square value of the uh, uh, of what you need to do is delta square by 12 pi integral NTF of j omega minus 1 mod whole square d omega 0 to pi. This is what you want to compute, okay, which happens to be the same as this. Hmm? So, you can see that the mean square value of the noise like waveform at the input to the quantizer can be several times the, the variance of the quantizer noise itself. Delta square by 12 is the mean square value of the quantization noise added by the quantizer, <coughs> correct. Okay. And that is getting amplified by the sigma k h square of k minus 1. Does it make sense? So, for example, in a third order modulator with 1 minus z inverse the whole cube, this is 1 minus 3, 3 and 1, I am sorry, and minus 1 and I need to knock off the delta. So, I get rid of the 1. So, the mean square value of this is nothing but 9 plus 9 plus 1, which is the mean square value of the noise waveform at the input to the quantizer has a variance which is 19 times the, the variance added by the quantizer itself. Okay. And that makes sense because we found that the NTF has got something like this, has some response like this. So, it is basically amplifying high frequency noise at the expense of low frequency noise, right. So, the total noise now is uh, at the input of the quantizer is, is much larger than the delta square by 12 that the quantizer itself is added. Does that make sense? So, if I get back to this diagram, when I was here, the input to the quantizer is basically this DC, this chap here plus some noise like waveform with some fuzz around it, right. It is DC plus some, some stuff like that, okay. And it has got some variance which depends on the NTF and in the no overload region of the quantizer, the gain is 1. So, the variance of this waveform of the noise on riding on the DC value is simply in the particular case of a third order modulator will be 19 times delta square by does it make sense? Now, as the input DC values increased, what do we see? The poles, I mean, uh, so the moment you start getting close to the vicinity of the of the clipper, clipping level, what do you see? The gain of the quantizer for the noise signal starts to fall. Thereby, as we discussed, the poles of the closed loop system start to move towards the j omega axis, correct. And the poles moving towards the j omega axis causes the quality factor of the poles to go up, 
I mean, and for those of you who don't understand the statement, in the S plane, the moment the the poles start getting close to the j omega axis, the quality factor is increasing. Does it make sense? The quality factor is the ratio of the imaginary part to the really real part in the in the S plane. Okay. In the Z plane, what? How are we getting the Z plane from the S plane? Yeah, yeah. The, the math is all alright. But what are we doing physically? We are taking this stuff here, okay, and then making it a circle. You understand? So anything that's close to the J omega axis in continuous time is close to the unit circle in in discrete time. Okay. And the same thing happens with the Smith chart. All the Smith chart is nothing but those of you who have done EM, right? The Smith chart is nothing but it's a bilinear transform in another uh, uh, in another disguise. That's all. Okay. So whatever happens to impedance, regular impedance, when in the Smith chart, it's like taking the regular plane and then just folding over the geometric axis into a circle. So what is at infinity will happen at minus one in the Z plane. Does it make sense? Okay, so as we see, so as we start getting closer and closer to the geomega, uh, closer as the poles start getting closer and closer to the geomega axis, the variance of the noise at the input to the quantizer must increase because the quality factor of the poles is increasing. If the quality factor of the poles is increasing, what does it mean in the time domain impulse response? It will last for a longer time, which means that mean square of h square of k is bound to increase. Okay. So the moment the variance starts to increase as we get closer to the saturation level, what is happening? Clipping is happening more frequently, which means what will happen? Gain will fall, further fall, which means that the the poles will move even closer to the j omega axis, which means that the noise level will get increased even more, which means that the clipping happens even more, and I mean so very very rapidly. The moment you hit start hitting you know the uh, the saturation level uh, uh, things start to degrade and the moment uh, i mean and this kind of you know is a runaway like thing okay this feeds on itself and soon uh, the uh, the the system just simply becomes unstable does that make sense so one thing you definitely cannot expect the output to be sta uh, the uh, modulator to be stable okay for input signals that go all the way up to the saturation level of the quantizer, correct? Because the moment you start getting close, you start clipping, which means that all the stuff that we just talked about starts to happen. So you definitely cannot expect the loop to be stable, okay? If you put in, I mean, if you know that the input range of the quantizer is so much. Correct? You cannot expect to put an input signal which which is sitting there, right? Because the moment you put such a signal, the noise gain is so small that the closed loop poles will almost surely be out of the unit circle. Does it make sense? So, and also uh, another way of looking at the same thing is that the output is nothing but an average value of the input. I mean, sorry, the uh, the the desired signal, the output is basically jumping up between several levels, right? And the average of those levels, local average of those levels, is is representative of the input signal, correct? So, the average, if the average has to be equal to the input, then sometimes it has to be greater than the input, and sometimes it has to be less than the input. It can't be like how some math prof said. I want all of you to get above average, right? It doesn't make sense. Okay, so same uh, same thing here, right? You can't get, you can't everything, uh, you can't expect the if you want the average of the output to be equal to this. There's no level here at all beyond is the the quantizer is saturating, so it will never be able to the output will never be a, be able to equal to the input. So there will be some fuzz around the the nominal value input value. Okay. Which means that you must make sure that the the uh, the frequency with which the quantizer saturates is sufficiently low. 
it, if it saturates too often that is equivalent to saying that the gain is, is falling off rapidly with input signal. Does it make sense? So, in other words, there is signal dependent stability and there is what is called a maximum stable amplitude or MSA associated with the modulator, right. And this maximum stable amplitude is telling you the DC level beyond which the modulator goes unstable. So, what is the problem with, uh, so yeah, so what is the problem with higher and higher order modulators? We see that for a, so for a second order modulator, the out of band gain is is 4, for the third order modulator the out of band gain is 8, okay, somewhere here, okay. So, for a fourth order modulator what will the out of band gain be? 16. So, what do you see as uh, the modulator uh, order starts, I mean, if you want to realize noise transfer functions of the form 1 minus z inverse to the power of n, as n starts to increase, we see that the out of band gain is increasing dramatically, right. And what does that mean? So, even if you are in the middle of the quantizer characteristic, it means that as the out of band gain of the modulator goes on increasing, the variance of the noise is larger and larger and larger, okay, all right. So, which means that what happens if I start moving the input DC level higher and higher, when is it more likely to, I mean, which of these orders do you think is more likely to clip as the higher, as the order goes on increasing, the, the quantizer is likely to clip large uh, more frequently if the noise variance is larger and that happens the moment you have a higher order system. So, as the order goes on increasing, while it is definitely true that the in band quantization noise is reducing, the maximum stable amplitude of the modulator which is the DC level beyond which the modulator becomes unstable, okay, starts to de decrease in fact dramatically. Okay, so we will take a look at this, we will continue.